Today, we're looking at a structure that's so much more than just concrete and steel. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. This is a project that is literally reshaping the energy, the economy, and yeah, the politics of an entire region. Okay, let's really get into it. To understand a project this monumental, you have to start with one single fundamental question. It's the question that really drove this whole thing, from a simple blueprint to a massive reality on the Blue Nile. And here is the answer in one absolutely staggering number, 65 million. Let that sink in for a second. That's more than half the population of Ethiopia living without something as basic as electricity. This right here is the human need at the very heart of the dam. So what was the dream here? Well, it was always way bigger than just building a power plant. This was about forging a brand new future for the whole country, built on pure ambition and the will to get it done. The motivation for the dam really boils down to two huge, crucial goals. First, you've got the practical side, the desperate need to escape energy poverty and power a modern industrial economy. But just as important, maybe even more so, was the symbolic goal of hydro sovereignty, finally taking control of a natural resource that starts in their country, but was, for decades, controlled by old colonial-era treaties they were never even a part of. But here's the big question. How in the world do you pay for a project this massive, especially when big international loans might not be on the table? Well, Ethiopia's answer was pretty incredible. It looked inward. The dam was funded by its own people, citizens in the country and the diaspora abroad, all buying bonds. This wasn't just a clever fundraising trick, it was a powerful statement of financial independence. It meant total national ownership over this project and its future. So we know the why. Now let's get into the how. I mean, how do you actually build something big enough to tame one of the world's mightiest rivers? Let's take a look at the anatomy of this colossus. You know, a lot of people think of the GERD as just one single structure but it's really a system of two massive dams working together. First, you have the main dam, a 155 meter high wall of solid concrete that stretches almost two kilometers across the river gorge. But just as critical is the saddle dam. It's this five kilometer long rock fill barrier that basically plugs a natural dip in the landscape. Without it, the giant reservoir would just spill right out the side. And those two dams, they hold back an amount of water that's almost impossible to imagine. The Millennium Reservoir holds 74 billion cubic meters of it. That's about one and a half times the entire average annual flow of the Blue Nile. It's not just a reservoir. It's basically one of Africa's new Great Lakes. Now, building something at this scale and speed required some incredible innovation. But when you tame a river, you also create brand new challenges, including a hidden one that threatens the very lifespan of this whole multi-billion dollar investment. The key technology that made this all possible was something called Roller Compacted Concrete, or RCC. Now, don't think of it like the traditional liquid concrete that gets poured into molds. It's more like, well, like damp gravel. It gets spread out in layers by bulldozers and then packed down tight by heavy rollers. The method is way faster, way cheaper, and makes it perfect for a gigantic project like this. And they got incredibly good at using it. Check this out. In December 2014, the construction team set a world record. They placed over 23,000 cubic meters of this RCC in a single 24-hour period. That kind of insane efficiency is what made the dam's ambitious schedule even remotely possible. But, and here's where it gets really interesting, we run into a hidden challenge. It's something called the silt paradox, and it's a direct result of stopping a river as powerful as the Blue Nile right in its tracks. So the Blue Nile carries a massive amount of silt and sediment from the highlands. And here's the paradox. By trapping pretty much all of it, the GERD is a huge help to downstream countries like Sudan and Egypt. It stops that silt from clogging up their dams, but in solving their problem, it creates a serious one for itself. All that trap silt has to go somewhere, right? It settles at the bottom of the GERD's own reservoir, slowly but surely, reducing its storage capacity and shortening its life. So the real engineering solution here isn't more concrete at the dam site, it's ecology. The only truly sustainable way to fight this is to stop the problem at its source. This means massive watershed management projects up in the Ethiopian highlands, building small check dams, replanting forests, and, most importantly, giving local farmers real economic reasons to switch to more sustainable farming. 
the biggest challenge is actually happening miles and miles away from the dam itself. So with all this in mind, where does the JURD really stand on the world stage? To understand its ultimate purpose, we've got to see how it compares to the other mega dams out there. When you put the GERD side by side with other giants, a really surprising story starts to take shape. I mean, look at pure power output. It's actually smaller than China's Three Gorges or the Itaipu Dam. But then, look at that reservoir capacity. At 74 cubic kilometers, it just absolutely dwarfs the others. It's not even in the same league. So this is the defining feature of the JURD. It's not about how tall it is or even how many turbines it has. It's the sheer, unbelievable volume of water it was designed to hold. And that massive size, well, it points directly to its core mission. The reason for that gigantic reservoir is one word, regulation. The Blue Nile is a river of extremes, a massive, raging flood during the rainy season, and much, much lower flows the rest of the year. The GERD is engineered to be a giant shock absorber. It captures that huge seasonal flood and then releases the water steadily, smoothing out the river's flow and guaranteeing a reliable, steady supply of power all year long. It fundamentally changes the rhythm of the river. And the ultimate vision for this dam, it stretches far beyond Ethiopia's own borders. Yes, of course, it's going to power the nation's own industrial growth, but its capacity is so large that the real end game is to become a regional energy hub. The plan is to export clean, renewable electricity to its neighbors, building shared economic prosperity and helping drive a really critical shift away from fossil fuels across all of East Africa. So we're left with this. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is, without any doubt, a triumph of engineering, a modern marvel. But it also sits on a river that is the shared lifeline for nearly 280 million people. The concrete has been poured, the turbines are spinning, but the ultimate success of this entire project might just depend on whether the genius of its engineering can be matched by the spirit of cooperation needed to manage a river that, at the end of the day, belongs to everyone.